Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the eighth and the final webinar in our series of uh, live Q&A sessions for Safe Work Month 2021. This morning, we have WHS authorizations, licenses, registrations, and accreditations for you. So essentially, this morning is your opportunity to ask some questions of some key people with regards to what the processes uh, are likely to be around um, licensing and registration under the WHS regime. This morning, we're fort fortunate enough to have Margaret Sharp, General Manager, WHS Licensing Implementation. Margaret's got more than 20 years experience in senior roles in the West Australian public sector, mainly in the delivery of government land and building projects. She holds a BA Honours in Geography and a postgraduate qualification in Project and Program Management. She's held licensing general manager roles for more than six years and is currently preparing the Demers Licensing Services area for the implementation of the new WHS regulations. Uh, and assisting Margaret this morning is Bill Mitchell. He is the general manager of the WHS legislation project. Now, I did introduce Bill through a number of these, but I've skipped over his bio for a fair bit. Uh, I will do it again quickly this morning, just so that we're all well aware that he's got a postgraduate qualification in business law, and he's got over 20 years experience in policy development. He is the work health and safety uh, project general manager for the Department of Mines, Industry, Regulation and Safety and has been involved with this project since its commencement in 2008. Now just, uh, sorry, just before we, we get underway, um, the department would just like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we deliver our services, and we pay our respects to elders, leaders, past, present, and emerging. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Margaret Sharp, as Ben's described. I'm looking after the licensing services implementation of work health and safety. So my focus today is to take us through the processes and the proposed regulatory requirements to be granted a licence. Um, I also can provide some information on contacts and how to go about um, interacting with the department with regard to your licence. So the work health and safety licenses, registrations and accreditations, the ones that I'm gonna be uh, talking about today cover construction induction card. That information is mainly for RTOs. Plant, so the registration of items of plant and the registration of design of plant. High risk work licenses, so the high risk work licenses themselves, those changes, and high risk work license assessor accreditation. If you're an assessor, you may already notice that you, the name of your authorisation is changing. It's going from registration to accreditation. So that's the kind of information I'll uh, keep talking about throughout this pr uh, presentation. Then asbestos assessors and asbestos removal. Asbestos assessors is a brand new licence and asbestos removal, the two classes, and demolition. So that's the scope of the type of authorisations I'll be talking about. So the affected parties, as I've mentioned, um, this uh, presentation is aimed at authorisation holders. Those of you who are already licensed, what is gonna change for you under work health and safety? Those preparing to apply, you might not currently be licensed, but you're thinking about entering an occupation that is regulated. Equivalent interstate authorisation holders, there's information here that as Western Australia is now moving into the work health and safety um, regime. There are a lot of interstate authorisation holders that will be able to more seamlessly come and work in Western Australia. Training providers, RTOs, there's information here for RTOs and employers and businesses. So that's the content of this information is aimed at those groups. So I'm going to start with construction induction. These are the changes that we're likely to expect. As we know, these regulations aren't final, um, but this is what we're working toward. So this information is mainly for RTOs and fundamentally it's pretty straightforward. If you deliver construction induction training, white card, as an RTO, there will be a new agreement for you to sign with the regulator. That agreement reflects the new work health and safety changes and it's about how to 
um, interact with the department, how to get your cards, that kind of thing. It's going to be emailed to you if, because we know who you are. You've already got an agreement with us under OSH um, and we'll be providing you an, a new agreement in the next few months for you to sign. The main change here for you will be about replacement cards. The new Work Health and Safety is intended to say that um, if an applicant needs a replacement card, they have to satisfy the RTO that the card's been lost, stolen or destroyed. So that is really your main change and we can help you with that once you get your new agreement. Changes we can expect for plant registration. So this is about mine site operators, applicants, and those applicants are those with management or control of an item of plant. So that's about some new reside requirements that we can go through. Um, it's about plant on mine sites requiring registration and that is will be transitioned. So day one, there's nothing really you need to do. You will be contacted and taken through that process and investigating how to enable, we are in investigating how to enable bulk application processes for those mine site op, um, operators. Similarly, the replacement registration document that I talked about with the RTOs in the white card, that there'll be an application form, a fee and reasons, you need to provide reasons to satisfy the regulator that the card has been lost, stolen, or just uh, that the registration document has been lost, stolen, or destroyed. Registration of design. Again, it's the same people that we're talking about applicants, businesses undertaking design, and those in management and control of an item of plant. So the changes for the registration of design include the reside requirements that the applicant must reside in Western Australia or satisfy the regulator. Um, as to the reasons why they need a West Australian registration and replacement registration document, application form, fee and reasons. High risk work licences, what's changing there? So this is affecting RTOs, high risk work licence, boiler classes, basic and intermediate, reach stacker, oper reach stacker operators, high risk work licence assessors, applicants and employers. So there's two new classes. Reach Stacker, that's transitioning and there's a new course for that. And the new class, Standard Boiler, that is also being transitioned. So for boiler class holders, basic and intermediate, you will be transitioning automatically into Boiler Standard. There's a new requirement here for statements of attainment and notices of assessment. They, uh, there's a 60 day requirement. This is particularly important for high risk work license assessors um, that the date of issue of those two documents needs to be within 60 days of the application for the high risk work license. And um, applicants may apply for renewal within 12 months. Renewal of interstate licenses in WA is possible and replacement license document um, also applies. There will be an application, a fee and a requirement to satisfy the regulator. And there's a new look, new look license card and that you'll get that at your next renewal. High risk work license, license assessors, this affects them and applicants. The two new classes that I've talked about. So obviously if you're a high risk work license assessor, um, it's in Western Australia, you can start looking into being able to assess reach stacker and boiler standard. You will need to obviously add those to your license. Um, the renewal of interstate licenses in WA will be possible. Authorization name changes, as I mentioned right at the beginning, from accreditation um, to accreditation from registration. You'll get, um, if you need a replacement um, authorization document, your proof that you are authorized, um, you need to apply and there's new look accreditation card that you'll get at your next issue. Obviously that changes from registration to accreditation. There'll um, be for all um, other than high risk work license for all accreditations under work health and safety there's no renewal grace period. 
there's no renewal grace for you grace period for you now and I just got to make sure that there'll be none un, that you know there's none under work health and safety asbestos assessors so this is a new license type it's transitioning so on day one asbestos assessors won't be required but over a period they will be introduced it affects occupational hygienists asbestos removal class a license holders and applicants so there's a new um, course um, and there's also uh, a requirement for asbestos assessors uh, only required for class A work and that is um, undertaking air monitoring, issuing certificates and undertaking inspections and there will be the capacity to renew your interstate license in WA and it applies to individuals only there's reside requirements and replacement license documents. There's also no renewal grace period. Asbestos removal. Some of the changes under work health and safety are also transitioning. So it expect, this information affects asbestos removal license holders, applicants and RTOs. There's a name change. So currently your asbestos license is maybe called unrestricted. You will be now be called class A asbestos removal and those who are currently called restricted you will be called class b so the application um, and there will be a fee for a new card there are prescribed vet courses and that's what they'll be um, there's five-year duration so currently you're not a five-year duration for your uh, license but you will be in the future under work health and safety there's a reside requirement, renewal in Western Australia and replacement license document. New look card um, that will be coming your way at the next issue and no renewal grace period. Demolition, what can we expect for demolition? So this affects demolition license holders, particularly class three. So class three is being abolished. If you hold a class three demolition license, you'll be contacted directly provided with information and a refund for the balance of your license will be coming in 2022. Um, there'll be that those refunds will be coming your way. Um, there'll be an application fee for a replacement card. There'll be a three year duration app, um, replacement license document. No renewal grace period under work health and safety. Okay, that's the end of my stand up part. And we'll be moving now to the question and answer. Right, thank you for that, Margaret. Here we go. Will I still have 24 months to renew my higher risk work licence? Um, so currently um, applicants for the renewal of high risk work licence um, have got quite an extended period. Under work health and safety it changes slightly. So the regulation outlines that it will be 12 months. So you can renew after expiry date for a period of 12 months or longer, if you can satisfy the regulator that there are circumstances that justify the renewal for longer than that. So it's a bit more complicated process. The, our system, high risk work license holders will know our system really well. It's online and it's gonna change a little bit if you lodge the, um, a, an application for renewal after 12 months. There'll be um, a different workflow for you. So it is it is changing. It's going to be 12 months and then maybe longer if the regulator agrees. So the other side to that, I suggest, is that you need to monitor the expiry date for your licence and ideally get it in nice and early. Okay. Will the WA Asbestos Assessor licence application be available to applicants prior to January 2022? Um, it is intended to publish beforehand. Um, we won't be able to accept that application or assess it um, and, and certainly not grant it until the regulations are in, but it is intended to have it up there 
um, in its final form um, before the regulations commence. Um, what activities now require a high risk work license? Um, so they're the same as OSH. Um, there's 29 classes under OSH and then the, there's two new ones that I've just outlined under Work, Health and Safety, which is the REACH stacker that's transitioning. It won't be required on day one. And then this new class, so it's still boiler, um, but it's the amalgamation of two classes, basic and intermediate, to give you standard. So it still works out to be 29 with only those two changes. So if you have a look at the either the OSH regulations or the Work, Health and Safety regulations, um, there's, a com there's a complete list of all of the various classes there for you. Can a notice of assessments be extended further from 60 days due to postage being slow in regional areas? A lot of NOAs are being rejected due to this problem. Um, the regulation outlines that it's the date that the application is made. So it's not the date the application is received, it's the date the application is made. It's the date on the application. So if the date, if you, if the application is um, created and made and signed off and final, that's the date that the 60 days start on, not the date that it gets posted into Demers. Do turf managers on a golf course need to have a license to apply chemicals? Oh, that one's outside my scope of expertise. Yes. So there's no particular requirements in the work health and safety laws, um, but there may well be other other laws, and I would suggest that you um, check with your employer um, and get some advice from them. It's, as Margaret said, it's not a matter within the work health and safety laws or the OSH laws for that matter. Are you aware of how many unregistered, uninspected, uninspected items of classified plant exist in our state? Well, unregistered, no, we don't. We, um, there might be some various uh, investigations that may reveal certain, um, on certain mine sites or workplaces, but overall, no, that's an unknowable. That, well, that's right. So classified plant particularly relates to the mining sector. That's the way I'm interpreting this anyway. We do have, um, various estimates, um, but at this stage, the classified items of plant don't require item registration. So we don't have a list because they're not registered, but we do have some idea about how many there might be out there, um, but uh, nothing definite at this time. Licence to operate a reach stacker has been required to operate a reach stacker in other jurisdictions for many years. When will WA require this? Um, it's being transitioned, so it will be in the regs when they commence, um, but we're looking at a 12 or a 24 month transition for the requirement of a REACH stacker. If a person has completed the BOHS asbestos sampler course, does this equate to an asbestos assessor? Um, it doesn't equate. So the requirements for an asbestos assessor are intended to have some training requirements. There will be some training that you'll need to demonstrate. And that is either the prescribed course, there's a VET course about air monitoring, or a tertiary qualification. There's also, so if that, um, that matter that was just re referred to is a tertiary qualification, that might meet the requirements. It depends on what the regulator determines. Um, and there's also experience requirements. So if you want to become an asbestos assessor, you need to demonstrate some training and some experience and that it will be prescribed and in the forms. So the best thing you can do is make your application and um, that application will be evaluated. Margaret and I were mm -hmm. talking about this earlier and um, it's an opportunity for you to provide as much detail as possible to convince the regulator of your qualifications. Will there be more stringent license qualification requirements for the Class B asbestos licence due to a higher level of competencies required by the new work health and safety laws? The uh, requirements for Class B will be um, for a new Class B and for those coming into work health and safety, there is uh, specific training requirements and one of those is the VET course supervised asbestos removal and for Class B, because that's 
non-friable um, non asbestos. Um, it's removal of non-friable asbestos. Those two VET courses will be required. Um, and for new applicants, uh, just like now, demonstration of relevant experience. Are there any impacts on occupational licences such as for gas works? Um, not that I'm aware, uh, outside my area of expertise. It's not a matter within the work health and safety laws or the OSH laws for that matter. What is DEMERS doing to combat fake high-risk work licences out there being provided as evidence of competency? Mm, um, I'm not particularly across this, but I know that it's definitely part of what our investigators in our compliance area would be looking into. So you can check up on, there is a duty of course on the PCBU to make sure that the qualification is appropriate and we publish a list on the Demers website that uh, you can use to verify uh, those details and if you have any, if you have any doubts about the person. Yeah, and certainly um, we can't know everything and so if anybody has any concerns please contact us. Is the definition of class one and class two demolition work staying the same? It is. It's coming straight over from OSH. Does the register that the regulator is required to keep include those licences by the regulator or those performing work regardless of where the licence is held? Uh, in Western Australia, the registration in Western Australia is kept by the West Australian regulator and contains only those West Australian licensed entities. However, all of the registers are public, so all of the other states and all of the registers kept by the other regulators are publicly available on their websites. Um, the next question is, not quite sure if this fits the topic completely, but can you please uh, clear up where and for what items of plant a verification of competency is required? So this is a general duty and it mainly, I think mainly relates to the mining side of things. The work health and safety regulations and the OSH regulations and the mine safety inspection regulations don't actually prescribe the requirement for a verification of competency. That's a general duty that um, people have to make or PCBUs have to have to make sure the persons are appropriately um, qualified. So in other words, if you are operating an item of plant or doing any work, the PCBU has a duty to make sure you are competent to do that, that work. A change of nominated supervisor is a licensed requirement with the state the licence is granted in. Would WorkSafe know if that has changed if the licence is held in another state? Um, it is a requirement under it's, um, the version of work health and safety that we're pursuing that the register not only holds the details of the license holder, it also holds the details of the nominated supervisors for um, asbestos and demolition. So if the other states have adopted similar provisions, the nominated supervisors will be on those registers as well. Um, I'm imagining it would only become, you know, um, relevant if there was an incident occurring and there was some need to know if uh, this person who was working in Western Australia was um, a, an approved nominated supervisor um, and under those circumstances uh, you could we could look up on the public register of that st of that specific state. Thank you. Why is it that purchases can be made of pressure vessels from a retailer and no advice is given to the purchaser that the item of plant requires registration. Mm. So under the work health and safety regulations, there is a duty on the uh, supplier to make sure, uh, to ensure that um, if the, the item of plant is design registered. So the, um, the supplier is aware or should be aware of the registration requirements. There are no actual requirements to be, uh, for that advice to be provided, but clearly um, if the retailer is aware and they should be aware, of plant that requires registration, they should be passing that information on. Under the work health and safety laws and the OSH laws, there's actually a shared duty there as well. So the purchase person purchasing plant um, should be aware if it requires item registration. So generally the uh, items of plant that require the registration are substantial items of plant. They're not, for example, um, 
a, a hammer. You don't need to register that, which is, can be an item of plan anyway. You get the idea. So there is a shared responsibility, but yes, I think it's quite reasonable to expect that if um, you're purchasing an item of plant that requires registration, the retailer should be uh, should be telling you. Um, class three demolition license is no longer required. So what is required? Um, class one and two, um, and that work that was was regulated under a class three about roof roofing material, brittle roof, roofing material, that doesn't now require a license to be undertaken, um, but class one and two uh, demolition licenses are still in place and they will still be in place with the same scope under OSH. Will interstate licensed asbestos assessors who reside in WA have their details listed in the WA LAA list? My New South Wales license has a two, there's two years left before renewal. Um, so if you reside here, but you hold a license in another state, your details will not show on our register because you're not licensed here. Um, and in the event that you wish to get a West Australian license, you can apply when your license is due for renewal, you can apply to renew your interstate license here and receive a West Australian license. And then your details will show on the West Australian register. So it's not about where you live, it's about where you're licensed. Can I transfer my interstate license to WA? Um, there's no specific provisions to transfer. However, you can renew when your license is due for renewal on all of the licenses under Work Health and Safety, um, you can apply to renew your interstate license and receive a West Australian license here. But there's no transfer where at any time you can just swap one for the other. That That isn't a thing that Work Health and Safety contemplates. Because one of the other elements of Work Health and Safety is that all licenses uh, equivalent, you can work in any state with that license. So you don't really need a West Australian or a Queensland. However, if you want one, the opportunity is to do it at renewal because that's an administrative um, process for you anyway. So you don't need two, you don't need transfer and renewal, you can just do it at renewal. How often will I need to renew my demolition license? Uh, three years, it's going from two to three. Is my OSH license still going to be valid or do I need to get a WHS license and how do I get one? It's still valid. So if your actual document, because so on day one of commencement, you are licensed under work health and safety. It, you, you, everybody transitions. Your license document will still say OSH. It'll still say if you're asbestos removal, it'll still stay unrestricted, but that's okay. The transition arrangements and the law allows for that. The compliance office and the licensing areas allow for that. The register, because that will update, will say work health and safety and you will appear on it. You will get a new card, a new license document reflecting work health and safety at your next application. So if you, when you renew, you'll get a new one or if you apply for a replacement, you'll get a new one, or if you add a class, you'll get a new one. You don't need a new one because it'll all be automatic and you will get a new one that says work health and safety and some of those other name changes when the next time that you're gonna be due to be issued one. How long should it take for Demers to assess a change of nominated person, not of nominated person for a restricted asbestos licence? The um, application for a new nominated supervisor is um, is a whole application. It has an application form, it will have a fee, and it will, will require quite a lot of analysis, particularly of the experience elements. Um, and we have a commitment to turn those around as quickly as we can because we know people are in business. But um, if there is further information that is required, we'll pursue those. It's not really 
it's not not really able to say how long it will take because every application and every applicant is different. What is the current requirement for new crane licenses to first have a dogger's license? Hmm, outside my area, yeah. So um, that doesn't that's not regulated within mm. the work health and safety or the OSH regulations. I understand that um, the unit of competency, which is within the jurisdiction of uh, the VET regulators, there have been some issues where that has been required, but um, I understand that is being reviewed. So um, the work health and safety in the OSH regulations don't impose that particular requirement. Um, and as I say, you probably need to check with your VET regulator. What is the current requirement for crane licences to first have a C2 or C6 licence? Mm, somewhat similar question to the last one. Yeah, the, the requirements to get your crane licence will be what they are. Um, it won't be a regulated no. so prerequisite. You need to have a um, statement of attainment mm -hmm. and a notice of assessment and make an application. So I suspect there's an issue underlying there which I'm not I, I can't pick up from the question, but um, if you have any further inquiries, um, by all means, um, send the details into WorkSafe and we'll see if we can provide an answer for you. How often will I need to renew my demolition licence? Yeah, we've um, we've had this one. It is changing, um, so the duration is increasing to three years. Uh, the LAA, which is the Licensed Asbestos Assessor course, um, is, yes, that's the course. What is the requirement for an independent, competent person to provide? Uh, so, um, the to there is no independent, competent person um, under a licence. If you either apply to become a licensed asbestos assessor, that's and it's only individuals, and there's no requirement for nominated supervisors. Um, and the requirements for a licensed asbestos assessor are um, relevant experience that the regulator will assess and two training requirements you can choose to demonstrate. There's either the VET course, which is the asbestos assessor VET course, or a relevant tertiary qualification. What auditing will take place for the new asbestos training? Current art TOs, operators have a very low standard. So the work health and safety laws and indeed the existing occupational safety and health laws don't regulate VET courses. If you have any particular concerns about an RTO, um, the two organisations I mentioned earlier, the, um, the Training Accreditation Council or the Australian Skills Quality Authority, um, they, are the, so they are the entities, the government entities who control RTOs. So if you have concerns, can I suggest you make um, specific complaints to those agencies, ideally with uh, names, dates, and people who are prepared to um, uh, substantiate their concerns. Will interstate licensed asbestos assessors be recognised by WorkSafe WA? Um, they are able to work here, and they so recognised. Yes, they will be able to work here. Um, they fall under uh, the compliance regime of work health and safety. They won't be on the register, um, but they, they I suppose if that's what's meant by recognised, yeah, they, they can work here and they fall under the compliance regime. Why are the fees so high for Class A asbestos licence? Um, the fee modelling for, for application fees is based on cost recovery. Asbestos licensing requires very high levels of interrogation. It's it's a very um, important that people are suitably qualified to become to be granted an asbestos license, and um, it's a fee cost recovery model. It um, takes a high level of assessment and very often involves um, ongoing. Uh, dialogue with the applicant to uh, ensure that they really meet the requirements as outlined in the in the regulations. Um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of expertise to assess them. So here's another money one for you. 
Two years ago, WorkSafe significantly increased the cost of an unrestricted asbestos licence as cost recovery. What will happen to licence fees now? Uh, similarly, they will be, um, uh, they're based on cost recovery and they'll reflect the new requirements under Work Health and Safety. I'm not able to say what's actually going to happen to the, the costs themselves. That's not information that we've got yet. What is the course of action if someone lets their high risk work license expire past the 24 months? Future 12 months, but they still need the license. So um, if you're familiar, and for those of you who aren't, um, the renewal of high risk work licenses are done online. And um, so under Work Health and Safety, you can renew up, you can lodge an application um, up to 12 months after expiry. Under Work Health and Safety, if it's past that 12 months, the system will say, this is past 12 months and will direct you to another workflow. And that workflow will take you through some steps of the things that you need to do to apply to the regulator to be allowed to um, lodge your application after the 12 month grace period. Um, there's no, it, it very much depends on your particular reasons and, and an assessment by the regulator as to whether this will be allowed. So um, you may or may not get approval to um, lodge your application. So do think about that very carefully and um, keep in mind, you know, that uh, the, your requirements and what you need to work um, and yeah, determine that very carefully because you may not get approval to lodge, lodge an application after the 12 months. So as we mentioned earlier, I think the answer is make sure you're aware of your um, expiry date and um, get it in as soon as possible. Silica, uh, silica, will workers who work with silica ever be required to be licensed? So um, silica has been a very topical issue in um, not just in WA but Australia generally, particularly for the last couple of years. The government and the Commission for Occupational Safety and Health and uh, the department have undertaken a, no a number of initiatives um, and that's included uh, some regulations in relation to silica. However, there, at this stage that I'm aware of anyway, there's no particular proposals for silica workers to be licensed. I'm not saying it's not being discussed in places, but I'm certainly not aware of any uh, licensing proposals. Why are high risk work licenses taking so long to be granted? Um, it may seem like a lengthy period. Um, they do need to be assessed thoroughly. These are very important decisions that the regulator is making and for the safety of the worker and the employer and the community, um, these processes do need to be adhered to with a degree of rigour um, and that can take time. So it may seem like a lengthy period, but um, these are important decisions that get made and there are tens of thousands of applications that come to Demers every year and they all need to be um, assessed to meet the requirements. Is an induction card an accredited course being considered for the agriculture industry? It's a bit like the silica one. I'm not aware of any um, particular proposals uh, under the OSH and work health and safety laws. There is no particular requirement for an induction card. Although once again, as I've mentioned earlier on, there are duties on various people to, in terms of making sure that um, people are trained appropriately to do the work and that duty is on the uh, the workplace, particularly in relation to the PCBE. So if you have workers in the agricultural industry, irrespective of whether they have an, uh, an induction card or whether uh, the courses are accredited, they must be adequately trained to do the work uh, safely. What are the changes with the NOAA's documents and will assessors be sending books back to WorkSafe? Um, so the NOAA's, the Notice of Assessments, which is a document that is used by high-risk work licence assessors when they're assessing the competency of high-risk work licence applicants, they are changing and 
for example, where there are currently references in those documents to OSH, they are changing to work health and safety. Um, and new versions are going to be sent out um, to high risk work license assessors in the next few months. It's very important that high risk work license assessors update their postal address with us and they can do that online. Um, and it is intended that uh, those OSH documents that you have do need to be disposed of. Um, they can, we will take them if you're able to get them back to us, we will take them certainly and dispose of them, um, and, but we will be relying on the high risk work license assessors to dispose of those old OSH books in an environmentally responsible manner. Um, and for the high risk work license assessors to be aware that we won't accept OSH NOAs after the first 60 days after commencement. So, um, yep, new, new books are coming your way in the post. Please ensure that you've got the right postal address with us because you'll need those new books. How do people in WA who hold interstate uh, licenses, asbestos assessor licenses, be referenced here? The, this is a competitive disadvantage as our contact details will not be available to the public. Um, they won't be available to the public. Um, you may wish to apply for a West Australian licence to be on the register. Um, obviously, you're running a business, you can advertise however you like, um, but it is correct. You're correct that you won't be on the West Australian um, register. Um, and as I've said, asbestos assessors are transitioning in, so there's actually no requirement them in, for them in Western Australia. Um, for those three areas of regulated work for um, several months if, and 12 months after the commencement of the Act. Um, regs. Um, the next two questions I think we've just recently answered. So how long should it take for DEMERS to assess the change of nominated person for a restricted asbestos licence? What are the new fee schedules for licences under the new Act and regs? Um, the fees, the Minister is um, uh, considering some options for there and once again the, uh, the decision in that uh, regard will be announced as soon as, as possible. Will fleet management have a shared responsibility to manage that plant is registered along with the authorised sale? I'll say that again. Will fleet management have a shared responsibility to manage that plant is registered along with the authorised sales? agent. So maybe that's mobile plant? So in terms, if you recall the first part of um, our presentation, um, there is um, a requirement if there's someone is a supplier that they ensure the item or plant is design registered. Um, and I would expect that they would make that information available to people who purchase the plant, the authorised sales agent. And I would imagine if the sales agent may be the supplier, I would imagine there's an expectation that they should know the uh, requirements. And if they do, that information should be provided to the person purchasing the plant. And as I said earlier, it's it's substantial plant. And really, if you're buying that uh, plant, you should you have a duty anyway to know what the requirements are. If it is a cost recovery, will the Class B licence fee now be increased to match the new charges? There is a thousand dollar, sorry, eleven thousand dollar cost difference between the licences. Well, I think that's similar to the question we had earlier about the fees. At this stage, they have not been determined, um, and we will make them available as soon as as soon as we can. Are we able to get more clarity on demolition class two regards internal demolition above one point eight metres? and whether this is only if it is a load-bearing wall. Mm. So those requirements are specified in the Work Health and Safety and OSH regulations about what they cover. I'm sorry, I just can't remember the 1.8 and 2 metre thresholds, but those details are uh, clearly described in the, in the regulations. So if you have any doubt, um, just check with the regulations and that should make it clear for you. What will occur if, say, 20 square metres of non-friable asbestos 
needs to be removed in Marble Bar, Pilbara. There are no asbestos competent persons local to clear. Uh, yes, it, if it's regulated work, it, it needs to be um, undertaken by an appropriately licensed person, regardless of where you are in the state. Will the requirements for the white card change? Uh, no, white card requirements are not changing. The course is not changing. Um, the, the elements that are changing are that the agreement between the regulator and the RTOs who provide the training and issue the cards, they're changing ever so slightly. Um, and a new agreement will be sent out to RTOs very shortly. What about shot fire tickets? Will they need to be reissued? So the shot fires, as I understand it, are part of the um, dangerous goods legislation and there's no um, requirements in the work health and safety laws that will impact on shot fires so, uh, that I'm aware of anyway, so um, there should be no difference there. How will Work Health and Safety Act Section 26A impact training providers who train in safety fields? So 26A is the uh, work health, relates to the work health and safety service providers. And um, in terms of education, um, sorry, first of all, 26A is, is aimed at specific advice that um, might be provided in relation to a work health and safety matter. So it might be um, an engineer providing advice about the safety of a particular rock wall. In terms of training that might be provided to uh, by uh, RTOs or any entity for that matter, um, it's not. It is unlikely that that will be specific training because you're providing information about uh, how how to approach work. Uh, you might be talking about how to complete safe work method statements and those sorts of things. There's no direct relationship between the um, between an incident. And I was just talking about that. In terms of um, undertaking a prosecution, the department would need to prove beyond reasonable doubt that um, the training caused a particular incident. And I, in general terms, that is extremely unlikely. So generally the work health and safety, under the work health and safety laws, the training is unlikely to be um, have any consequence under 26A. Can you please explain what is defined as an independent competent person that can provide a clearance on a Class B asbestos removal license? Mm. So, Class B. So, mm. Class B, there is a requirement that you have an independent competent person. So, the, the uh, Work Health and Safety Regulations have a definition for a competent person, and that relies on things like training, work experience, um, and those types of issues. So it's a matter for the PCBU to determine whether the um, um, competent person is in fact competent to undertake uh, undertake that work. And that's, uh, that's consistent with the existing laws in any event. The uh, independent competent person, um, the definition has come almost straight across from the OSH into the work health and safety laws. Why are so many pressure vessels sold or able to be purchased without adequate labels on their capacity, unable to determine pressure vessel and requisite wrecks? So there are some minimum requirements um, in terms of um, documentation on uh, pressure vessels, uh, but if you have any concerns about the adequacy of those um, that information, um, you should really take that up with your supplier. Eastern States provides suites of templates for businesses with WorkSafe provide such or just information sheets. So I'm not sure what the suite of templates are. WorkSafe has a um, significant number of documents which are uh, checklists, there are safe work method statements, so there is a large number of, um, uh, well, I call them templates, checklists, etc. Um, if you can provide us with some details, we will certainly um, consider supplying those details or supplying those documents. Uh, I've mentioned previously that the department has a significant number of documents 
that we're looking to transfer from OSH to uh, work health and safety, um, but we will do our best to accommodate any reasonable requests. Will my, applica will my application to renew my asbestos removal licence still be accepted up to 30 days after expiry? No, it won't. So I'm very pleased to have received this question. Um, this is a very important thing for asbestos removal licence holders to be aware of. Um, and again, it reinforces that very important issue that you keep your contact details up to, up to date with us because we will send you three SMSs months ahead of your renewal date and you must get your application it must be received by us before your expiry or you will expire and if you want to keep working in that field you'll have to submit a new application from scratch so it is very important that you get your application to us before your expiry date Will registered, will registered assessors have some direction for the use of their new NOAA books? Yes, when they get sent to you, uh, information will be included on how long we'll accept OSH NOAAs for, which is only a few days, and um, how long and when we will only take work health and safety NOAAs um, and what to do with your old books. What is the time frame for organisations to register plant if it is currently unregistered? And I suspect this has to do with the classified mine, plant yeah. in uh, mine. So we are in the process of um, developing the uh, transition period for the, uh, for the plant and um, that information will be provided as soon as possible. I have an HRWL assessor registration. What do I need to do to get ready for work, health and safety? Um, nothing, unless you want to start to deliver assessments for reach stackers or bo uh, boiler standard class. Um, so they're the two new classes that are coming in. You can start to look into um, getting trained in those, getting your own high risk work license for it, getting some experience in it, and then being able to be an assessor. Um, otherwise, there's nothing you need to do. Um, you will receive um, a new document, a new license card at your next application that will look a little bit different. It'll reference work health and safety, and it will say, High risk work license assessor accreditation rather than registration. So they're um, fairly, you know, um, they're not substantial changes. Um, and other than potentially contemplating assessing those two new classes, there's nothing you need to do. Are VOCs recognised by DEMERS? And if not, are they still required? So um, the work health and safety laws and the OSH and the mine safety don't specifically prescribe the requirement for VOCs. Uh, generally, that's something that's um, in the mining sector, although of course it can be used in other sectors as well. Um, so it's not a matter of Demers recognising that training. It's, a, um, uh, it's actually imposed by the, uh, uh, the employers to make sure that people can do the job. And I mentioned earlier, the requirement for PCBUs to make sure that uh, their workers are adequately trained. And this is one way that uh, an employer can verify that uh, an employee or a worker has the required skills. I would, should say only one way, there are other ways as well. Will I need to get a registration for all items of plant I have already registered under OSH? No, um, your OSH will carry forward um, and much the same as the transition for all the authorisations types. It's part of the legislation that that just automatically occurs. If your plant is registered under OSH, when Work Health and Safety comes in, it will be registered under Work Health and Safety and there's nothing you need to do. What is the transition period for the asbestos licensing? There's been no formal correspondence on what changes are required. Yeah, um, the transition is that asbestos removal um, is going to transition over a period. Um, so it is important for people, for asbestos removal holders to know, there's nothing you need to do, but you do need to know 
that um, you, in 2022, those who are renewing in 2022 um, will not re be required to renew. You will be written to in the next few months and advised that you are getting an extension to the term of your licence for that transition period. So there's nothing you need to do for in preparation for 2022. Just be aware that if you've got if you if your renewal is due, you won't need to renew, and we will officially tell you that um, in the next few months. Um, just for your information, we're now coming towards the end of our um, time allocated to conduct the uh, the webinar. Um, but if you keep your questions coming in, we will endeavour to um, address those questions. Um, in some of the guidance material we um, we will produce, and of course we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. But I think Margaret has a commercial as I, well. Yes, I do have a commercial. Um, it, it's a very important for licence holders to keep their details up to date with us. Um, we will send you SMSs if your mobile phone changes. You need to update that online. If your postal address changes, if your email address changes, please do contact us and update those pieces of information because that is how we will communicate these changes to you. That is how we do communicate the expiry dates and send you the forms. So it's absolutely essential that you keep your all of your information up to date with us um, and then that will make your life much easier. What happens with the notification of information changes under Regulation 506? What happens if they conduct work in other states? 506. I'm not sure what, you know, there's so no. many, there's 700 odd regulations there, I just can't remember 506. But if the uh, if your licence is in another jurisdiction, well, you need to update the information in that jurisdiction. If it's in Western Australia, you'd need to tell, uh, tell Demers. It might be asbestos removal up high there. Perhaps, yes. Mm -hmm. So, I, but anyway, if you have an interstate license, you need to update it in your home agency, with your home agency, and if it's in WA, you will need to tell Demers. Why is a company allowed one license holder for asbestos removal? Why can't they have two, three in case of turnover and loss of that single license holder? So perhaps they mean nominated supervisor? I suspect. You can have as many nominated supervisors as you like. Uh, obviously, they all need to be a approved, they all need to meet the requirements, but you can have attached to your licence um, as many nom nominated supervisors as you like. Will current high risk work licence holders receive information regarding the changes to their licence, i.e. renewal, time frame and requirements? Um, for those licence holders where something is changing, well really, which is only um, the boiler basic and boiler intermediate, they will receive notification. Otherwise, nothing is really changing for high risk work license holders um, and there's nothing to notify you of. So, as I mentioned earlier, we've now arrived at uh, the time where the webinar is complete. Um, our time has expired. Thank you for attending today and your questionings. Um, just a reminder that, uh, as Andrew mentioned when we first started, the webinars will be available on the Demers website once uh, Safe Work Month has uh, completed. This is the last in our uh, Safe Work Month, last in the series of our Safe Work Month webinars and uh, once again thank you for everybody who's taken part and contributed uh, to it. It's been an enormous help to make sure that we can get as much information out as possible. Um, you can also, um, and you can see up on the screen there, uh, there's some contact details and we would encourage you to uh, use those details if you haven't already by all means subscribe to the WorkSafe uh, websites because of course we'll be providing information about the work health and safety laws through that and of course the other social media options. So once again uh, on behalf of Demers and everybody who's been involved in this process, thank you for your attendance and um, all the best with the work health and safety laws. Thank you.